Hi, Megan. Hi, Robert. How are you? I'm okay. You know, you remind me of my mother. Uh, <laughs> in what way? Not age, you'll be happy to know. Um, I'm and glad also to your hear lives. That. That's another contrast. But um, she called me Robert. Oh, sorry. Should I should, should I call you? Bob? No, I like it. I like it. I like being reminded of my mother. Keep calling me Robert. Um, I usually go with with uh, Mr. Wright for people that I, I don't that, know well in person. But. Whatever level of respect you think is appropriate, um, I encourage great you to respect, demonstrate. Great respect. Okay. So you uh, this morning you did get your iPhone fixed, is that right? I did. Um, I it had it started like um, just not picking up calls. I could hear that it was ringing, but the screen was black, so I couldn't pick up the calls. So uh, yeah, I drove out to Clarendon, and uh, they very nicely replaced my iPhone for free. Mm-hmm. Uh, heartily, heartily recommend uh, both the iPhone and Apple Care. Well, well, now here's a kind of a paradox. You're you're recommending the iPhone, and yet you did have to have it fixed. I've never had to have my cell phone fixed. If iPhones are so great, how come you had to have it fixed? I don't know, but I had to have my my razor fixed too. Um, so I guess like for me, it's uh, not that sort of out unusual. Um, yeah, okay. I guess there is that. On the other hand, like, most people I know who have iPhones have not had to have books. Yeah, but there is the keypad problem, right? I mean, I'd love to talk myself into owning one of these, but I do a fair amount of email, and you just can't tell me that it's not a problem. Um, I am not. I hate thumb typing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for me, it's actually quite fast. And it, it, it recog- yeah. the word recognition is pretty good. So if you, you're typing with one finger anyway, and that... And that yeah. Yeah, that's a, that, that makes a difference, I think. Um, so, yeah, if I, I mean, I never had a BlackBerry. Yeah, right. So. I, I'm looking for somebody who used to have a BlackBerry or a Trio and swears that the, that the iPhone is, is no worse, but I haven't found such a person. Well, Peter Suderman, with whom I, uh, with whom I waited in line, uh, to get the iPhone, mm-hmm. he, I, he says that it's about 15% slower to type on mm. the, uh, iPhone and on the BlackBerry, but it's not a huge difference. I'm a busy guy, 15%, and uh, our, our, our company's stock price would probably be way lower if, if I had to, if I lost that efficiency. But, um, so, we're, uh, what are we going to, what, what's most in the news of the things we were going to talk about? This, uh, I guess this Illinois governor is, um, <laughs> his, his, his future's not looking as bright as maybe it was at one point. No, no, I think, um, hilariously, he actually campaigned as a reformer. Don't um, they all? I mean... And apparently what he meant by that was that he was going to charge more for his services than previous Illinois governors had. Yeah, Perhaps cool. deliver deliver those those brought you know, deliver services and returns for bribes more efficiently. Um, you know, open up a bigger I mean he did yeah. he did apparently use sort of almost an auction process, which is uh you know, good. He's harnessing new technologies, you know? Absolutely. And to I put it on the internet. They should just, you know, a, an eBay approach to selling offices. Yeah, I mean, I think that their IT approach on this was actually pretty weak, and I think they could definitely have harnessed uh, those resources way more effectively mm-hmm. than they did. Um, and I think that that's something that the next Illinois governor should definitely look into. Yeah. I think the funny part is that uh, apparently, you know, like, people are calling for him to resign. You would have thought that it's sort of once the governor is arrested for selling his own services, it sort of goes without saying. Um, Although I, I think the kinds of uh, governors who get arrested tend to be, rate a little higher on the shamelessness scale than perhaps the average governor to begin with. The recordings are actually, I mean, I, you know, I was out last night in Washington, out and about, and the, both from my liberal friends and my libertarian friends, now my libertarian friends generally basically assume that this is what happens and this is how this... But we assume that it's kind of more subtle. You know, that, that there's sort of a nod and a wink, and if you do this for right. me, maybe your highway gets approved or right. whatever. Um, I was every- wondering that, because the various things he was asking for, some seemed more brazenly corrupt than others. You know, it seems like if what he wanted was somebody else to get some office, it seemed a little not so bad as him getting some cushy job with a union or something. Um, and... When you think about it, this is really an invitation for corruption. When one person has the power to appoint somebody to an office this important, it almost has to happen that every once in a while they start asking for a price. And, and in fact, you know, the other weird thing about this is it's the only occasion I can think of where somebody appoints someone to a position that's of greater importance than the person himself holds. It's like... 
Presidents appoint cabinet members. Cabinet members don't appoint presidents. But right. this is a weird case where really most people would say Senate is a more prominent, desirable position than uh, governor, and yet you've got this governor making the call with, that, with, no, with no checks. I mean, does anybody have to ratify these things? No, it's, he has he is, uh, totally unfettered uh, ability to do it. And what's actually interesting is there's this long history of governors appointing, you know, even less, for example, appointing themselves. Um, and Which he was prepared to do, apparently. Yeah, yeah. exactly, He was because he, he thought it would clear up his legal problems. Um, and you know, no one worries about that. Um, no one frowns on the uh, the appointing of it, but somehow when he's selling it off, that seems worse. Even though yeah. I mean, they're both clearly about personal gain. Now you had a uh, when we were chatting briefly before we uh, started taping, you had a news flash that I had not heard. Yeah, Fox News is reporting that sources say that uh, Jesse Jackson Jr. was uh, candidate number five, the guy who actually agreed to cough up. Uh, five hundred thousand dollars in exchange for uh, for the Senate seat. Now, if um, that turns out to be a true, it's it, true. It's been a bad season for the Jackson uh, dynasty, I would say. Yeah. Starting was, starting with Jesse's uh, uh, on camera remark that was meant to be off camera. Yeah, I would say that uh, the, the the Obama presidency in general has not been a, a, a good thing for for the Jacksons, which is perhaps a little counterintuitive. Um, but yeah, the. You know, and this is actually what I had predicted, not because I have some particular animus against Jesse Jackson, uh, but because he seemed to me to be, of the likely candidates, the most likely person to be able to lay his hands on $500,000, um, you know, hmm. given his father's political connections. Um, hmm. and I, the fact it, it, I gotta say, it surprises me. I mean, we don't know, even if what you said is true, even if the allegation is true, we don't know that Jesse Sr. was involved, do we? No, no, I just mean that, you know, someone with that kind of extensive personal history in Chicago politics is probably, to me, more likely mm -hmm. to know people from whom he can get, uh, excuse me, my light just went off. Um, <laughs> is, is that a bad thing? It's on, a, my light is on a motion sensor that doesn't work very well, so there's going to be this moment where I go dark, um, and well, then come back on. It's going to be very, like, special effects for free. Are you um, still in the dark? No, 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 I've turned it back. I just have to wave my hand near the motion sensor periodically. Okay. Um, but, you know, given that, he just seemed to me to be more likely to have the kind of personal connections that would allow him to easily get the $500,000 in untraceable cash mm -hmm. to pay off uh, to pay off Blagojevich. Boy, this would be a shame. Um, now, Jesse Jackson is a minister, is he not? Yes. Um, but, you know, the... You know, politics, especially urban politics of Jackson's generation, mm -hmm. was, I think, more corrupt than it is now. You know, I think that all of you know, that stuff is slowly going, in part because the federal government has taken a much larger role than it used to yeah. in cleaning those machines out. Um, but, you know, I mean, the, I, I think the uh, the long, you know, when, you, when you've got that much power, you know, that's how politicians in urban areas used to get elected. They, you know, they used to have parties where... Uh, union, you know, union reps would hold parties where you had to drop money. There'd be a fishbowl, mm -hmm. and you would drop sort of cash in the fishbowl, and that was just sort of an accepted part of doing business in New York, for example. And that's all changed. You know, all all of that stuff has been cleaned out. Um, but those people, a lot of them, are still around and didn't get caught. And I assume that, that Jesse Jackson Jr. knows a lot of them. Wow. Um, this is going to be um, this is going to be interesting. Um, I think it's going to be it's going to be really hard for for Jesse Jackson if this turns out to if it turns out to actually um, to be his son, um, and I think you know it's sort of just a sad day for the Jackson family. But on the other hand, it's also you know the fact that um, you know the fact you know, people's kids do bad things. It's not necessarily because they're bad parents. It's just... No, I, I really uh, subscribe to that view you just expressed. When kids do bad things, it's not because they have bad parents. And, you know, sometimes it is, but rarely. Like, I, I think, you know, you can't... There's a point beyond which you can't control your kids. You're telling and, me. Uh, you're telling me. <laughs> it's so true. Um, this is why I don't have any. Um, wise woman. A wise woman. Um, no, no. Kids are great. Kids are great. But, I, I, I'm in favor of kids in the abstract. I, I just I'm in favor of them in the concrete, even. But I, I absolve myself of all responsibility for their behavior. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So anything else on the governor? Um, um, well, I mean, 
No, I think I think we pretty much. Ta- I mean, well, actually, I think you know something that Clive Crook and and on our website had said that the, I the really, Atlantic's website. Yeah, because you know, on the one hand, um, Obama could not have asked for better absolution than Blagojevich saying on tape. Right. That, that all I'm going to get from them is appreciation. Right. Right. That's um, amazing. That's amazing. But something that I hadn't considered is you know people are still wondering who narked. Uh, you know, you sort of presume it was the low bidder. Um, but as, as Clyde Crick pointed out, it had damn well better be someone from the Obama administration, because if they were asked for this kind of deal, Uh um, and they didn't report it, they have an obligation to report it, and the president-elect can't be seen to be even approving of that kind of old-style Chicago machine Yeah, although, you know, the way the communication, I can imagine, happening is, you know... The guy kind of makes noises like, you know, it'd be nice if uh, I could get a little, you know, a friend of mine, a nice appointment. And the right. person immediately says, look, we, we, you know, we, we, sorry, we're playing this. You know, I, you know, in other words, I can imagine the overture being pretty vague and oblique and the person just immediately saying, you know, look, we're, we're just looking for the most qualified candidate or whatever. Right. Without, you know, without there being really a smoking gun, I can also imagine it being... Uh, well, I don't know who it would be. He certainly could be a surrogate and not Obama himself. I would ima- assume it is. So I don't know. I, I wouldn't imagine well, no, I... There's, there's a major scandal lurking there. I mean, I, I just think it's great that apparently one way or another he got the, right. the sense that the Obama administration uh, was not corrupt, at least in this particular case. Um, no, I don't think it would bring down the administration. I just think it's, it's sort of the kind of stain that you don't want to start out with, having to fire a staffer for having... You know, n- possibly known about something like this. And no, you'd, you'd like, rather you know, not. You'd like, really like, rather not. Like Scooter Libby, for example, which reminds us that that Patrick Fitzgerald is here proving his bipartisan uh, bona fides, right? By by uh, prosecuting this. Yeah, no. I'm su- I'm surprised actually because that um, you know when Spitzer was brought down, there was actually quite a lot of noise about how dare the feds be following uh, these, you know cash transfers that he mm-hmm. was doing, even though that's something that the feds do, in fact, follow in public officials totally normally, because if someone's making large cash withdrawals and they're a politician, you kind of tend to assume that they're making large cash withdrawals or they deliver that cash to some untraceable, mm-hmm. uh, illicit activity. Um, but there was a lot of noise about how there was, this, you know, it was the Bush administration politically prosecuting, um, persecuting, rather, Elliot Spitzer. Um, and there was this sort of really stupid report that came out that said, um, you know, under the Bush administration, uh, there have been ma- many more corruption prosecutions um, of Democrats than, than of Republicans, despite the fact that most of the major cities in the United States are controlled by Democrats. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not to say that, like, Democrats are more corrupt, but there's just, you know, are you really going to go after, like, the, the some small town in Illinois town treasurer? who embezzled $12,000. Like, the feds don't put an investigation on that. They put an investigation where they think they can bring down someone who embezzled, you know, half a million dollars from New York, New Jersey. You can Um, imagine an affirmative action program to assure that neither party is underrepresented in corruption scandals, but you would not be in favor of that. Well, it would be hard, just because you would have to... There are so many more... I don't know actually what the numbers are. Actually, I wasn't being too 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 serious about that proposal. So you don't you don't have to mount a really convincing <laughs> counter argument if you don't want to spend the time. No, I I just think it would be like imagine like all of the little towns you'd have to spy on. Yeah, there's that some problem. guy stealing like two thousand dollars from the community. The, the mere the, the inefficiency, yeah. Exactly. The inefficiency um, problem. So I would throw I would totally withdraw the suggestion. But you know what? If this guy, if this mayor, goes to jail. He may have to be bailed out. And that brings to my mind, Megan, the auto bailout. Ah, that was a seamless transition. I I, I do this for a living. I do this for a living. Um, So what do you think about that auto bailout? I think, well, I've been been crusading against it totally futilely for uh, for quite some time. But, you know, the shape that it's currently taking is even more terrifying than what I initially envisioned. Well, what was phase one of your terror? Uh, my terror, my phase one of my terror was just that we were going to give the automakers money and they were going to sort of piss it away and they would come back in a year and say, we need more money. Uh-huh. Um, which was a pretty good bet. But now, um, 
you know, there's a number of, of ways in which this bailout is really bad in a way that the banking bailout wasn't. Um, so this is phase two of your terror we're, we're yes. entering now? Yes. Uh-huh. So now we've got the Karzar, yeah. um, who is supposed to go in and disperse this money and, like, okay and not okay um, investments and so forth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the government is just not historically good at building cars, and it's not just the U.S. government. It's, you know, I'm really hard put to think of any government firm mm-hmm. that's, that's, you know, sort of made a, a, a good show out of running an auto company, mm-hmm. um, except, you know, into the ground. Um, and, you know, the weird thing is this is in the fine print of the proposed legislation. Not many people know this, but the cars are is going to be, according to the way it reads now, is going to be appointed by the governor of Illinois. <laughs> I mean, how weird is that? Because, you know, Detroit's not even in. Never mind. Um, no, it's, it's actually, it's kind of odd, actually, right? The, uh, it's, the Karzar is a weird position in a number of ways, like, who the hell is this person going to be? It's not like the U.S. is just, like, floating with awesome auto executives that we, we, we didn't know about before. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and yet we're, we're looking for this Karzar who's supposed to go out and, and save us all from, from the incompetence of previous administrations. Um, but there's also the fact that, um, it's being appointed by the Bush administration, and I'm puzzled by it, by it, why it's structured that way. Um, I'm puzzled. You mean as opposed to waiting for Obama? Well, I, as opposed to having Congress pick someone. Oh, I see. And you know, the Bush administration. Oh, it seems. Really, it seems you can imagine. Well, nobody wants the responsibility of having done it because uh, I think a lot of people suspect it may not have a very good reputation a couple of years from now, right? So. Right. It makes sense to me that, that all the Democrats would want Bush to do it, and, you know, Bush is like, what the hell, you know, he doesn't have anything else to do, I don't know. Well, I mean, why is Bush doing it, right? Like, there's no reason That's the question, is why it. is Bush agreeing, but uh, I guess, I don't know, I don't know. But uh, I guess he figures where does his legacy have to go, but up, I don't know. <clears throat> but there, I mean, like, you know, beyond that, there's actually, like, this gigantic issue, which is, first of all, um, as, as, ah, in the black again, sorry. Um, it's going it's to look periodically like I've just gone to a rave. I should have worn my black light hairspray. Um, it's not too late. We could pause. Do you have some? Do you <laughs> no, have some? I, I do, but it's at home. Oh. Um, or actually, it's in storage because I'm in the middle of moving. Um, I don't move into my new apartment until January 1st, so I'm, you know, crashing at a friend's place and totally at sixes and sevens. Um, but... If another country was doing this, as was pointed out in the New York Times, we would, like, be suing them in the WTO, right? This is the kind of stuff that we Well, that's the, that, that came to my mind. I was just thinking about that. How I'm guessing that as we head into this, this epic recession, if not worse, that the companies are going to be given kind of free reign. I mean, countries are going to be given kind of free reign in that regard. They're all going to be doing these things that, upon close inspection, amount to subsidies of their, interest, of their industries, that would arguably violate, uh, you know, the norms, if not the laws of trade. But uh, I'm guessing that everybody's going to say, you know, let everybody else buy. With I'm it. I'm not that sanguine. I'm actually worried hmm. that what you're going to get is a lot of people saying, well, if the U.S. can do this, then I can, you know, support X, Y, and Z industries, and maybe here's some import tariffs too. Yeah. Um, and that you know these disputes are going to get dragged out. Um, the other thing that, like, Felix Salmon pointed out uh, at Portfolio.com mm-hmm. is that, you know, GM, how are you going to handle, for example, Opal? We're essentially nationalizing these companies at this point, right? Um, so we're going to own equity in them? Is that the deal? And we're going to appo- appoint a guy who actually can coerce them into doing things? It's totally not clear what we're going to own. Mm-hmm. But what is clear is that this guy is going to be, like, dispersing capital. So we're going to effectively own it in the same way that you can do, um, you know, with like a backdoor LBO, basically, but you, you can basically take over a company if you buy up, if it has a lot of junk debt and you buy it up and you say, look, um, either you uh, either you give me your company, either you do what I say, um, or I will call these bonds, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and in the case of... Uh, this is sort of similar, right? The fact that the, the big three need financing from the government and can't get it anywhere but the government means that whatever his, um, you know, whatever the titular holding we have, this Karzar is going to have de facto almost unlimited power over the big three. Uh-huh. Um, and so essentially one guy is going to be running all three American automakers um, in some, like, really meaningful sense. Um, well, maybe he'll be someone really good, Megan. 
Um, you know, I tend not to think that. First of all, the the auto Detroit automakers' problems are not that short term. Right. Right. Like you know this, and I I tend not to think that the problem is simply that GM and Chrysler and Ford have had a lot of CEOs over the last 20, 30 years. Right. They can't all have just been complete morons. And Actually, yet, have you ever heard any of them talk? No. no. No, I'm kidding. But I do think, I actually think there's a surprisingly number, of, uh, a surprisingly large number of not very impressive uh, people who have prominent positions in American uh, business. That's my personal view, but... No, well, I, I guess what I mean is they can't all have been so subpar that the United States government has a very good chance of finding someone who can easily turn this around. Yeah, so I think the conventional wisdom is that markets do a better job of selecting... Uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's not even that. It's just like, what are the odds? You're picking yeah. one guy. Yeah, no, no, no. Look, I, I, I mean, I, I wish I could give you a big argument here, but, uh, you know, Mickey Kaus, uh last time, surprisingly, took the view that the bailout's a good thing, and he kind of tried to convince me, and, and I, I'm trying to keep my mind open, but my, uh, I, I just, you know, and, and perhaps unlike, certainly more than you, I'm happy with the government spending a lot of money to help the workers who 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 are in in a, in a bad way because of this? Well, I just think I there rather, are much more efficient ways to do it. I'm not <clears> against <throat> helping the workers. I mean, like I'm in favor, although I'm not sure that I'm in favor of helping the workers as auto workers. I'm in favor of, for example, right. like doubling unemployment benefits, and if we can get some sort of job retraining program that works, which is really difficult. Um, right. I mean, it, the, the record of government job retraining programs is pretty dismal, but, like, if we can figure out when it works, I'm in favor of doing it. I'm in favor of, of the safety net to ease the transition to another job. Um, I, you know, I might, I could certainly be persuaded to do things like relocation assistance. Well, I would even, go, I, I would even swallow something, although the rationale for this ultimately is weak, you know, of, of favoring a particular, workers in a particular industry. I, 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 I would be fine with, like, targeting the, you know, saying the auto industry is a special case, this is a huge... You know, so if one of these companies or more of these companies go under, we do X, Y, and Z for these particular workers. But when you look at how much money we're going to spend on this, we could, you know, set them up really pretty nicely. Um, we could give them each, like, you know, $50,000 to go start their own war on poverty. I, I think it is something like that. And the, the other thing is this, that, and, and this gets at something I was kind of arguing with Mickey about. Look. I think if you don't, if the government doesn't do anything, it's not like all three of these companies are going to fail on the same day. And, and as soon as one fails, I think that will actually help the other two because they're playing a zero-sum game, competing for customers, and and it will make the it'll make it easier for the other two uh, to get debt, you know, to, to get financing and stuff. And so I don't really think, although all three, I mean, less forward than the other two, but all three are kind of saying we're in trouble. I, I kind of suspect you would not be seeing the failure um, of all three, and and I don't know. What do you what do you think? Well, this is fundamentally a problem about GM. Um, you know, Ford, uh, luckily, presciently, whatever, mortgaged everything but the little blue oval uh, before the financial crisis hit, and so they're actually sitting on a pretty decent pile of cash. Um, they mortgaged in, in what sense? What did they, they do? They just mortgaged everything. They, 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 they borrowed just, against the They stuff? borrowed, they took, yeah, they issued secure debt against basically all of their assets. Um, Good thinking. And, yeah, exactly. Um, and so now they don't need to draw down credit lines, they don't need to roll debt the way that, uh, that the other two do. Okay. Um, Chrysler is in a worse position, but the, the consensus is like, GM's asking for the most money, and they're the most likely to actually go into bankruptcy immediately. Um, and th there's sort of a weird issue here, which is that everyone wants to support their automakers. There's something, mm -hmm. like, emotional about automakers in mm -hmm. every country. Uh, it's like airlines. There's, like, certain industries that people just, it, it like, tugs the heartstrings. Far well, there's also a union issue. There's a lot of people see this as de facto union busting, letting them fail, because that would be so many unionized jobs. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think the thing, you know... I don't know if it's union busting as much as UAW busting. The fact is, like, every company that the UAW does business with seems to end up in bankruptcy, except for Caterpillar, which which sat down and took a really long strike. Mm -hmm. um, the UAW is just... And, and in part, it's the way the UAW is set up. Um, they, unlike a lot of unions, they allow their, their... 
like a lot of unions only allow active workers to vote, and not even dues-paying members, but people who actually are employed in union jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, the UAW lets everyone vote, and because there are so many more retirees than workers, uh -huh. the union is basically run for the benefit of, of retirees. Basically, at this point, like they they want to milk the company until they die, mm -hmm. and then they don't care. Mm -hmm. And some of them do. They have kids in the industry, whatever. But, like, their incentive is to maximize their gain, not to make sure that, that GM is a long-term going concern. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's not, you know, they, they give concessions, but they only give concessions just to the point where the company can stay out of bankruptcy if everything goes right. Right. And then when things go wrong, they, they you know, they ask for a, a, a bailout. They, they, like, they make concessions so grudgingly. You can't operate a company that way. You can't operate a company where, like, Every single thing you do has to be genius, or else your labor cost. And you know their labor costs are only ten percent of their, their overall costs, as a lot of people have been pointing out. But like having labor, having your costs be five percent higher mm -hmm. than everyone else's is actually like that's meaningful, especially in a car. If a, if a refrigerator is five yeah, percent more, I, I mean, this is a question: Do you buy the argument that? The reason the Japanese uh, companies outcompete them, that, that a big part of the reason is the difference in labor costs between the ununionized factories in Tennessee that, or wherever that Toyota has and the unionized factories that the, uh, that the big yes, three has? I, I think there, there, there's a couple ways in which that's true. First of all, what GM chose to do, now they've reduced their labor costs somewhat, but what they chose to do for a very long time was in order to find the money Mm -hmm. or this is a, this is my understanding of, of, of how it works is that in order to find the money to pay their workers extra they use cheaper components and so a twenty four thousand dollar GM car just isn't like forget design or anything else like just from the get go now isn't that seems good. to me like the kind of claim someone would make that's pretty damn hard to verify I mean you you know if somebody found the memo where GM said okay in order to pay the union benefits. Let's 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 do crappy carburetors. Well, I, no, I, I, I mean, this is what pretty... I get. This is what I get from gearheads who well, who, who say, if, you know, for yeah, like that, car, that sounds but, to me like rank conjecture um, to be perfect. But the other candid. thing is the is the work rules, um, and this is uh, that's major, uh, especially the UAW. Like, and, and this is not a part of it. Like, I've talked to engineers who describe this stuff, or like, or you know, people who like a friend of mine's brother, for example, is an engineer. Uh, not no longer because the plant's closed, but. Um, was an engineer for a long time at uh, a Ford plant, uh, mm -hmm. an auto supplier. Not a Ford plant, but one of their suppliers. Mm -hmm. um, and the union, the UAW there, um, so Ford buys in metric, and the UAW wanted to work in Imperial. Why? No reason. They just didn't like working in millimeters, et cetera. They wanted to work in English measurements. Well, of course, English it, metric doesn't translate really easily and perfectly no. into, into Imperial, so you're, you know, you're working in like 37 of an inch or something ridiculous. Um, and then, well, wait, so don't you think maybe they did have a reason for that, which is that it, it made it harder to get parts from, uh, it, it made it more cumbersome for the company to get parts from no, much was, of the world rather than from the United States and, and Britain? Well, possibly, but yeah. I mean, this is a supplier. They make the parts. They're not... Oh, you, know, oh, you didn't say the union wanted to stick with Imperial? The union wanted to stick with Imperial. Right, but I mean, an American company is more likely to have an American union working at it. Right, right, right. But, but the union wanted to stick with Imperial even though Ford uh -huh. was working in metric, right? They were supplying a country, that, a company that wanted to buy parts in metric. Oh, I see. And okay. the union insisted on measuring, on, on doing all the measurements in Imperial, which meant that everything had to be converted mm -hmm. to Imperial and then converted the back. Okay. So you had to check stuff. You know, in metric before it went okay. out, and you got more errors. They also <laughs> things like they wanted to put in digital gauges, and the UAW said no. Mm -hmm. And the engineers were totally mystified. They said why, and the UAW said, "Well, we like the uh, we like the there's a red zone on the analog gauge, and we like you know no be able to see." And, and they were like, well, "Well, we can make it mm -hmm. flash red, you know." Uh, but yeah. so because the union had the power to do things, they do. There's a phenomenal amount of feather bedding, and they they try, they deliberately try to keep jobs from being, being done in more productive ways because that means fewer union workers. Okay, well, well, well I should say that I'm not a student of the unions or the auto industry, so I, I although I have sympathy for the, 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 the working person, um, I have no way to counteract the, your vast supply of libertarian anecdotes about the... Um, well, the, I, uh, my dad does collective bargaining for the construction industry in New York, or he used to, and, like, one of the... For the, we, for the industry he bargains... Yeah. Bargains on behalf of workers or on behalf of... He w he was the head of a trade association uh, for the contracting industry, so he was the guy on the uh, 
on, I mean, he was sort of a middleman. Um, and because the construction industry, like, these companies can be formed ad hoc and so forth, so that you always knew what you were getting, so that there was one agreement for all of the electricians or whatever. Okay. Was, all the asphalt workers. And but were the workers on the other side of the bargaining table from him or on his side? Uh, on the other side, um, but he okay. would, it, it was more, like, my dad's on the board of the laborers still, you know, like, it, it, it's, it's a weird sort of middleman position where... He's attempting to make a deal between the contractors and the and the laborers. Okay. Um, and they get they sort of get money from both sides. They they got it. They got money, you know, per worker paid. So they have some incentive to maximize the number of workers and, and how much they they make. Um, the way which is the way a lot of trade associations work when they do collective bargaining. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's the thing: like in, in New York in the construction industry, what you're actually seeing is a lot of non-union. Uh, work getting to a lot of non-union contractors were actually paying their workers as much or more than the unions. And union workers get paid. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One is legacy pension costs. So mm-hmm. they can say, like, look, I'll give you a 401k. I'll contribute to it. Um, but I'm not going to pay the pension contributions to cover, you know, people who, who are no longer working and never worked for my company because I started five years ago. Um, but the other thing is that the work rules, like, Local 3 in New York, which is the electricians, they really are, they do really good work. They also work five hours a day. Like, mm. they, they, they get there, they take a coffee break. They work for 20 minutes, they take another coffee break. And this is notorious in the industry. And they do really, really good wiring, but you can't get eight hours out of them. You know, um, and that's a major, and it's actually, like, written with their contracts. Okay, the commenters will have me lynched if I don't, if I don't <laughs> stop this stream of libertarian anecdotes, Megan, and, and, and give them a chance to chime in with their counter okay. anecdotes. Well. We, we, we should, um, l- let me, I, I mean, again, I am a skeptic of the bailout. And, and, and the final thing I want to ask you about is, uh, you will probably like this, uh, because I, I think you'll agree with me. I mean, Mickey, Mickey Kaus was saying that, well, you bailed out the financial industry. Why not this? And I said the financial industry is more susceptible to contagion, so that if one fails, there's a contagion of, of, of failure. And I think the auto industry, if anything, it's the opposite, where if one fails, it helps the others. And I think that well, this occurred to me after the dialogue. I think that the empirical test of this, and I don't know what the empirical facts are, but I would think the empirical test of this is my prediction would be that when a big bank or a big investment house fails, the stock price of its so-called competitors, other investment houses, uh, uh, investment banks or banks, the, their stock prices drop, whereas I would predict that if one auto company fails, the stock of the o- other auto companies goes up. Now, uh, we may not have the evidence yet in both of those sectors, but wouldn't that be your prediction? Well, it's okay, so there's... It's an interesting question. You know, the, what you're saying is true. The contagion doesn't work the same way. Like, I own a German car, right. and as, uh, uh, you yeah, know, if GM, if GM goes down, like, my car won't suddenly stop working, unlike, you know, my bank account might if another well, bank Well, more than down. that, people will not stop buying cars, period, right. the way they would all with put quit putting money in banks if they, if they start to doubt the entire banking right. system. It's just not going to happen. But I will say, I mean, one of the things that people are worried about, so the, the auto industry, like the airline industry and a lot of other industries right now, has global overcapacity. Um, right. And the UAW and, and the, the big three, as sort of the weakest, some of the weakest of those firms, um, has, is, is sort of a rich target for going under. Um, what happens in a bankruptcy, though, is interesting because if, if GM goes bankrupt, right, and they, they give their creditors a big haircut and they're in a p- position to be more profitable in the future, mm-hmm. that actually may force other companies into bankruptcy because they can't compete. You know, if mm-hmm. GM, this happens, you see this in the airlines a lot. Like, the airlines will shed, they'll, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll bargain down their union contracts, they'll shed a ton of debt, and then all of a sudden, other competitors, because they can now cut their market, they can get out cut prices, their competitors are forced, you know, closer to bankruptcy themselves. But in the case of the big three, I think it's just they have unsustainable, on a lot of levels, they have unsustainable debt, they have unsustainable every, they have unsustainable payments to a large mm-hmm. number of people, not merely unions or creditors or anyone else. Like, they just don't have, make enough money. So I think that at least two out of three of them have to go bankrupt. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really sad. Um, you know, this is the end of... of sort of a great American era of manufacturing. But the fact is, they just don't make cars that people want to buy. And I think that... Well, also, bankruptcy is not necessarily the end of the company. No. I mean, I, I think most people are, are 
you know, the, I think the sensible kind of bailout to do would be for the United States government. The worry is actually uh, when you declare Chapter 11, you need to um, you basically you Re- need to get something called debtor and possession financing, which is mm-hmm. financing that will allow you to restructure. And there mm-hmm. is worry that in the current environment, where you know credit is snapped back, they won't be able to get that financing, and they will be forced into liquidation. Well, it mm-hmm. seems to me there's a very good argument for the United States providing that financing for the government. You know, if we're really worried about um, about sort of a crisis liquidation and the kinds of effects that would have, then I think there's a pretty good argument for providing that financing to allow the, the companies to transition, to pay off the workers they need to fire, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't think that uh, there's a good argument because for what we're essentially doing, because we're, you know, it's not like this is going to be the last money. You know, they they're no, going to I mean, be that's back. My, that's my concern. They're going to be. Yeah. There are people estimating that, that the total cost of the bill is going to be 125 billion dollars yeah. um, for three companies. And you know, people are comparing this to the size of, of the financial do, bill. Do you know how many workers we're talking about directly affected? Leave aside like auto part. You know, well, I don't know. Fairly directly. I, do you know I about believe, how many jobs would? Have, I believe that in Detroit. Now there are, uh, you know, I don't think anyone's worried about the blue collar workers, frankly, uh, the white collar workers. You know, there are a mm-hmm. lot of those who are going to get laid off, probably proportionally, possibly more than than the UAW. But I don't think okay. anyone's really that. I, I just don't think like politically anyone's that concerned. The Democrats are concerned about pleasing the labor movement. They're not concerned. Well, do you about, know about how many factory uh, workers I believe we're talking the number, about? I believe the number is, is ninety five thousand, but I don't know if that's GM really? or the total. Um, like I, I, I mean, that's actually l- in a way less than I thought. But there might be a lot more indirectly affected at like auto parts factories who do half their business with American companies and half with somebody else. I also, don't know, that maybe I have two numbers in my head: ninety-five thousand to forty-five thousand is a number I've heard of, of the sort of cuts. But I'm just not sure whether that's GM or the whole in- or the whole industry. The other number I yeah. have in my head is one hundred ninety-five thousand, and that would make if ninety-five thousand is GM. Uh, 195,000 yeah. would make about sense for the, the industry as a whole. Um, and that's, you know, the, and people are saying that they're going to need to shed half their jobs. Yeah. Um, I still say just write the checks to the workers. You know? Well, I mean, th- but, this is actually really interesting because people have proposed this before. Uh, this always mm-hmm. gets proposed by libertarians because, you know, when the, we did steel tariffs, I think the cost of per job saved was like $800,000 per steel worker job saved. It's like, uh-huh. why don't we just give them $400,000 and call it quits? Yeah. Um, yeah. But the problem is that, like, politically, it's, that's really hard to do. But also, like, the workers don't want that. They want the job. And people keep saying that. And I actually kind of resent that. Like, I'm willing to help you if you need something, but I'm not willing to, like, also buy your crappy car to pretend that I want the car. Um, you know, it, I'm not going to pretend that I want your services. I will help you because you deserve help. But I'm not going to, like engaged some gigantic kabuki thing where we spend the rest of your life pretending that you're adding value to the economy so that you can feel good about yourself. Um, okay. and, and But I think that's really... And, and for the UAW, so you have to remember, like, for the, the blue-collar workers, the UAW has... You know, there's something called the principal agent problem, which is to say that managers don't have the same incentives as the shareholders, right? They, they theoretically should, but in fact they have their own game that they play. That's also true of union leadership, right? The UAW is not necessarily interested in maximizing the welfare of the members, it's interested in maximizing the welfare of UAW managers, and then secondarily, if they can accomplish that by maximizing the value of, of the members, and often well, they of can. Of course, you could say the same thing about the auto companies, unfortunately. Oh, absolutely. But, um, now, this is a, but this is a standard critique of, of industry management, mm-hmm. um, but it's also true of the unions, is that unions start engaging, and nonprofit corporations, over, they start perpetuating themselves above the goal that they originally they're, had is perpetuating yeah, themselves. Yeah, yeah. And that's true of management. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah, well, it's intrinsic in management that the, uh, I, I mean, it's a question of how you ultimately set up the incentive structure, who they ultimately are accountable to. You might argue that if union members who, after all, elect these people are sensitive enough to their actual interests, then these people would tend to reflect their interests. Oh, no, no, but right. Anyway, you can you, often further, they can often perpetuate themselves by furthering those interests. All I'm saying mm-hmm. is that, like, if, they can, if it comes down to the worker interests and their own interests and those diverge, mm-hmm. you're mm-hmm. going to see, so the UAW is negotiating on behalf of the workers, and the UAW wants future jobs to collect future dues from. So they are right. not going to be interested in a deal that involves the UAW going away and each worker getting $50,000. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm saying. Okay. 
Well, we should move on, but, but it is, I was glad to hear that you are offering to personally write checks, signed Megan McArdle, to workers who are displaced in the course of yes. this. Did I understand you correctly? Well, uh, you will not buy their cars. You will transfer money given to them. the sad state of my bank account um i am willing mm-hmm. to offer a check for two cents to uh, any auto worker who will apply to me that's a start um, but i need a sassy now, on that so it's not going to be a self-liquidating investment well you can't have everything um so i have a quick question these these this piracy thing you know now if i understand libertarianism correctly you would say that so long as the pirates are pursuing their self-interest it's good for the world no no. Uh, oh, I misunderstand yes. libertarianism. You are not entitled to pursue your self-interest coercively. Oh, oh. Yeah, sorry. So, what do you want to do? What do you think we should do about this thing? Um, well, I mean, like you know, as a good libertarian, I think a good place to start would be arming the merchant ships. Um, ah, I was afraid there might be a role for government, but no, no. no I'm also in favor. Like, I, I'm cheering on the Indian Navy. Uh, I, you know, first of all, like. I, well, wait a second, though. This is a transnational problem. I'm trying to steer you toward embracing global governance here, Megan. Um, I th- how, how am I doing so far? Well, I think that in theory, that's one of those things that should be done in theory, just like peacekeeping should be done by UN force in theory. Um, in practice, it doesn't work so well. Um, well, have we tried it in a meaningful way? Well, we've certainly tried UN peacekeeping. Um, you know, yeah, I think there, there, there are certainly government issues on piracy, but... They're hard to organize. Um, but, I mean, here, here's the... Pre- there's a serious free rider problem here, is it's not in the interest of any one nation. Well, there may be nations that have a disproportionate interest, okay. but let's face it, it's quite a burden for any one nation to take... I mean, a lot of people are saying, look, the, America's got the biggest navy in the world. You do it. Well, I'm saying, as an American taxpayer, no thanks. It's an, it's an international problem. I'm not going to foot the whole bill, and I don't want America to receive all the intangible blowback that you get when you start killing people. Well, I mean, I think that the interesting thing is that there's there's kind of this weird confluence of good incentives, which is that India is trying to further its place as a major power, right? Mm-hmm. And so they have an incentive to take on these pirates in the same way that the U.S. had an incentive to take on the Barbary <coughs> pirates in the in the beginning of the 19th century. Um, just to show people that, you know, they can kind of kick some ass. Um, and that's what they've been doing, and uh, I think that's great. But, but can I argue against that? I mean, first of all, I, I think the, the identity of these pirates is a little unclear in my mind. I mean, are they... There, there, there may be some association between them and the uh, Islamic courts, uh, like insurgency slash government increasingly in Somalia... I mean, are, 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 the, are the pirates or some considerable number of them uh, Muslims? Um, I'm sure they are because they're Somali, and as far well, as see, I know, most Somalis are Muslim. Okay, so here's the problem is Al-Qaeda and these, these guys who did this thing in Mumbai, right, the narrative they want to foster is Muslims around the world against the Zionist crusader axis, which they, uh, Hindu axis, right? I mean, the narrative they want and are clear, right. clearly trying to sustain as they move us toward a clash of civilizations paradigm for viewing everything in the world, which is what they want. They want India, Israel, America, England, blah, 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 on one side, all the world's Muslims on the other. It seems to me, if you have a situation where the Indian Navy is confronting Muslim pirates, you're kind of playing into their hands. Well, here's the problem, though. As far as I know, no Muslim country has a significant navy. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I, uh, I'm maybe just not thinking about it. Well, 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 even, yeah, but even there are countries that are not Muslim that, are, that, that play into that narrative less thoroughly than India does at the moment, or, 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 or in general. Um, in, in fact, I would say uh, most Western European nations don't play into that narrative so conveniently. I actually um, disagree. I mean, I think that Al Qaeda, like they're very active in Europe for a reason. The, the Muslim immigrants in Europe actually perceive more anti-Muslim bias there than Muslim immigrants report here. I mean, in general, well, there's, any, a lot, there's a lot. Anyway. More well, okay. Well, it gets us back to global governance. It, then no one nation is the right nation. Some sort of consortium that includes some Muslim nations. I got to think that Saudi Arabia is not enthusiastic about this tanker having been pirated. So, some consortium of nations, including Muslim nations, uh, you know, put up the, the, the money and the, the firepower 
and deal with it. There, there actually is a, uh, a UN proposed uh, there, there, there's something just just in the, on the wire today. Some the UN is trying to organize some group of African coastal states to deal with this. I guess that would be okay with me, especially if it included you know Christian nations and Muslim nations. But uh, in any event, I, I don't like the idea of no Muslim nations being involved in enforcing this. Well, I'm, I'm not against a, a piracy initiative, like, on an ideological level. I think it's great. You know, I mean, it's the sort of thing that global government should do. I'm also, like, but I'm also, I'm a weird libertarian who likes things like global carbon trade taxes. Um, but the problem, I think, is that UN, you know, these, these joint UN initiatives often, in fact, turn out to have the same free rider problem that you have without the UN. Which is that, you know, if you look at UN peacekeeping, right, you've got a few nations who substantially can actually provide troops. And the rest well, of them yeah, just kind of, like, provide people who walk around in blue helmets. But it has worked that a UN-authorized coalition was effective in some context or another, like the Persian Gulf War, like the Bosnian intervention. I mean, it happens. Right. No, absolutely. But So, so it can't, it's not an in-principle I, no, I, I don't have an in-principle problem. I think that you will have a problem putting together this coalition. But if you can, I, I wish you Godspeed. I mean, I, I'm not okay. against it. Okay, maybe I'll end on that note. Libertor libertarians endorse global governance. And, uh, by the way, as for your first, the, the classic libertarian solution, you know, give arms to the, to the merchant ships, I'm, I think I read somewhere that so many ports have restrictions on arms being on ships entering them that, as a practical matter, merchant ships cannot have arms. But, see, now, I think that's a problem. And I think that well, that it may be a it. problem, but it's it, it's about it sounds about, about as hard to solve as the as the one the collective action problem you're saying would be hard to solve. I I, I completely it, to be a libertarian or to be any sort of a sensible libertarian is not to believe that anything that you think is a good idea has any remote chance of actually happening. Um, I mean, this is uh -huh. my life, right? I, so living in a dream world is is well, you know, not that that's a bad thing. Not that that's a bad. But you thing. know, it's it's you you push people like a little closer. You know, you, you keep pointing out but that this, if the relationships this is, were armed, that uh, this get this, this gets to my my question about libertarianism and modern libertarianism. You know, you people, come on, blogging heads, you know, and people from Cato, and they sound sufficiently reasonable that you, you think, okay, they're okay, but at the same time, it seems to me they're sounding so reasonable that in what meaningful sense are they actually libertarian? What does libertarian mean today? It used to mean an extremely austere view of what government can do. And it seems to me there are now a number of people who call themselves libertarians who just don't have that view, which raises the question of what are they other than kind of, you know, free market conservatives? Okay, well, l let me answer that in a, in a couple ways. Um, the first is that Controlling piracy is the kind of thing that any libertarian, I think, at any sure, time... Sure, sure. But, but you earlier talked about helping out workers, you know, that, you know, that yeah, you'd spend some money uh, to help workers. Now, that I don't think that's Ayn Rand talking, right? No, I but mean, I, I, like, I've, 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 I, I like Ayn Rand in the same way that I like, so, you know, Soviet realist fiction. Um, but I've never thought that Ayn Rand had a very useful model for how actual people might interact in any, you know... No, but that's what um, libertarian used to mean, this extreme view, you know, extreme laissez-faire view that was so much of a principled view that, you could, you know, it wasn't really amenable to, to argument about the real world, almost. I mean, right, well, I mean, what happened to the socialists? Um, it turns out to be harder to get there, and there also I think that the libertarians found that they had un... They had overlooked, I would say, that libertarianism has overlooked a lot of ways in which what I would call, like, the operating system of society, all of these norms and mores and law and things, they had overlooked the ways in which that was supporting uh, private enterprise. Um, and, that, you right. know, and that if you let those things erode, that culture really matters in a way that I think libertarians actually didn't really grapple with. Um, but... I would also say, like, my my take on libertarianism now is this, is that institutions, the, uh, Milton Friedman said, people always talk about, like, greed in business. And what Milton Friedman said is, like, look, businessmen are always greedy. People are greedy. They want things, you know, they they can be mean. And, and what a good system is, is a system that harnesses that greed for good. Um, and so what I would say is that when we're looking for systems that allow us to value, maximize, um, that allow people the maximum sort of freedom of choice, 
um, and control like our worst, most antisocial uh, impulses. And that, in so far as possible, we should try to set up systems that are self-regulating, because mm-hmm. the regulatory system itself has a lot of problems that tends to go awry, that tend to go awry. Like government has, you know, public choice theory has a number of sort of known issues that can make the regulatory system not work. And so, in as much as possible, I would like to see systems that by themselves seek homeostasis, um, that by okay. themselves bring themselves back to about where they should be. Um, sometimes that doesn't work. Um, you know, I, I actually, like, I would differ with libertarians in the sense that I don't think that there's any particular market mechanism that provides what I think most of us would agree is, like, a socially optimal amount of charity. I don't see any sort of regulatory uh, mechanism that provides that. There's a huge mm-hmm. rider problem. I think things like, you know, the environment are issues where the law needs to intervene. I don't think there's any, like, libertarian system of water rights. It's just insanely complicated, and what we have for property rights, given what we now know, doesn't work with... Um, but, you know, these institutions evolved, a lot of legal institutions evolved very slowly over time, and we didn't, and, and I think that we're still trying to evolve those. I mean, my default, though, is how do we set up an institution that does not require coercion, does not require physical force, ultimately, to back... Um, you know, how do we have an institution that relies as much as possible on voluntary exchange and non-coercive uh, action rather than, than ultimately requiring coercion and, vi- and ultimately the threat of violence um, to enforce it? Because I think that there are, like, many problems with that coercion and that threat of violence. Well, there are, but you, you can see there has to be some, because you can see there are some legitimate government functions. They require money. To get money out of people, you have to tell them you'll throw them in jail if they don't pay their taxes. Mm-hmm. So there has to be coercion. I, I agree. And, and, and the system that's saving us from is a jungle in which there's plenty of coercion, right? And, and, and this is one thing I think rich libertarians sometimes overlook is, um, you know, in a state of nature, you can't be a really rich person because someone will kill you and take your money. The fact that you can sit there securely on your pile of money is something brought to you by taxes that are collected. And one could argue that if you're a rich person, you have more at stake in that system than a poor person, and maybe you should pay more taxes, well, I mean, you, because you, a jungle would be worse for you than it would for a poor person. But you, you, can, you, can, you, know, you can play that both ways, right? In a state of nature, disabled people would all be dead. Does that mean that like they should all be so great, that they should be like uber grateful to society and be willing to give up anything they have, because uh, society is making them, you know, is giving them wheelchairs and so forth? Um, in a state of nature, many, many bad things happen. Women are oppressed, etc. I don't think that that means that I, as a woman, have to be specially grateful to the state and be willing no, to give more more of my money to the state than other people. But when the group that is privileged happens to be a group that has a huge amount of money, it seems to me that the argument uh, has a little more valence um, than it does in the case of, of a crippled person who has no money and just can't pay. Well, the I mean, taxes, women but. women are another example, right? Like in the state of nature, women are extremely disadvantaged. Uh, should I be more grateful well, to? Yeah, uh, I mean, like women women in women in less rich societies uh, are much I mean, worse treated. Well, uh, if you want a state of nature, a hunter gatherer society, it's actually a little complicated. I mean, in a, in a hunter gatherer society, for example. They tend to be, on average, in a certain sense, what you might call mildly polygynous. That isn't to say they necessarily have a formally polygamous marriage system. In any event, what I'm about to say is, uh, in those kinds of societies, compared to a monogamous society like America, you have uh, more males who are entirely cut out of the like sexual and reproductive sweepstakes than females. So there are real downsides to being a certain kind of male in those societies as well. I don't think it's 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 as simple as, as you're depicting. I think being in a hunter gatherer society sucks for many people. Um, in fact I you know, I don't think there's anyone who would voluntarily be in a, in a hunter gatherer society. But um, you know, I uh, despite the many lovely things that are written by anthropologists, I don't think any of us want to die at forty, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Women benefit more from modern society than men do. Like, they, they, like the, I, I think that they really do. Like, we are more equal in modern society um, in a way that we just were not able to be in, in more primitive societies. For we can argue about why, but I mean that that's just a fact. Yeah, although you're viewing that from the vantage point of modern society. In other words, if you did a, a poll of, uh, you know, if you went to a hunter-gatherer society 
where a woman uh, is allowed to easily reconcile a career, which would be foraging, by the way, with uh, motherhood because, because her infant accompanies her on her work. And you said, would you like to go live in a society where your, your you know, three-month-old infant uh, is separated from you ten hours a day? You have to choose or, uh, whether you, you either work and socialize with other adults or you tend your, your baby, but you can't do both. I think a lot of them would say that doesn't sound so great to me. So, so you're, you're, and, and I, uh, it probably doesn't sound so great to you. And, and it's actually an injustice of modern society that women can't easily reconcile those yeah, two but things. Frankly, but in general, just you're bringing the perspective of, of someone in modern society, the value system of modern society, to bear in comparing the two. And I don't, I, I don't think, I, I don't think that's I think a valid just deaths and childbirth alone. Are enough to be to say women are made much better off. Oh, look, um, they're very like, bad things. Um, but like, I guess I wouldn't. That's not how I think about taxes. I don't think about. Um, I think about them this way: is that there's there are collective goods that we all need to acquire and that are part of our social, our, you know, the, the 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 just price of being part of society, um, and that people should all pay in roughly equal amounts in terms of utility. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone should sacrifice about as much utility, um, but that for Warren Buffett, twenty five percent of his income is not as big a deal as for Warren Buffett's secretary, and that therefore Warren Buffett should pay a larger percent of his income because he he loses less by sacrificing it because there's mm-hmm. declining utility to extra money. Um, so I mean that that's how I think of it. So I don't think of it as like Warren Buffett has more and therefore he should pay us more. I think of it as like Warren Buffett has more and therefore. To, to sort of ease, equalize the pain of paying for these collective goods, he should pay more of his income. Okay. Um, Any rationale for him paying more than me, I'm, I'm good with. <laughs> you know, um, we're, we're, we're closing in on an hour. Can I quickly uh, make one more argument for global governance? Uh, sure. On this Mumbai thing, you know, Pakistan at last re- uh, report had, uh, had arrested, I guess, or detained the guy that they think may be the mastermind. The reports are kind of going back and forth on whether they've really done this. But in any event, they, they I, I, I gather, would not turn him over to India for trial. For one thing, there's no extradition treaty between them, I think. For another thing, it would you know there would be a lot of political capital loss within Pakistan for any leader who turned somebody over to India for trial. Solution? International Criminal Court, Megan. How do you like? What do you think about that? Um, I think that the difference between the real and apparent power in, uh, or the de jure and the de facto power in those institutions, is such that what people really want is for the United States to submit itself to those courts. Right? The United States does not gain enough. Uh, by doing that to... Well, wait a second. This is a good example where the U.S. would gain a lot from that. It would gain this, this thing is but peacefully would... resolved, that's very good for our national security. And if it degenerates into, you know, a shouting match that becomes a shooting match, that's very bad for us. So this is a, this is a clear case right. where we would benefit. This is a gain, but there are also clear cases where we would lose, right? And, and what are the losses? Um, the, the court wouldn't survive the first attempt to, put, to take an American president into court. You know Bush would get indicted, and you know that we would have to pull out. The, the court would last about two seconds. I don't know that Bush would get indicted. I mean, it, 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 I think these institutions, the U, they, turn to, they turn out to be pretty sensitive to the realities of power in the world. I mean, I don't really know the legal issues involved. And, 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 uh, and look, if it would be trivially easy to indict Bush, then it should be revised so it's not so trivially easy. Um, because I think uh, with any of these institutions, they should confine themselves, especially in their early stages, to the clear-cut cases. What happened in Mumbai, clearly, right. clearly, clearly something you want to punish. This was not somebody acting in their, in their capacity as head of a government in what they thought was a blah, blah, blah. So, uh, A, I don't know what the law would say as far as indicting Bush. B... These institutions often are sensitive to the politics, and, and they realize that if you go around indicting American presidents, it's going to be the end of the institution. So I'm not sure that would be... Uh, I mean, who else has gotten... I mean, why hasn't haven't any other uh, presidents gotten indicted by the ICC if it's so easy to do? Certainly some have done bad things. Um, this is, I guess, <clears throat> what I, I... I have a couple of, of issues beyond that. I mean, I, I actually do think that what you would, you would ultimately just get... Um, for it to have legitimacy, it needs to be able to. It needs to go after the powerful, and and, and the fact that the U.S. is basically the police force, um, I, I think you would you would end up with a real issue on that. Um, but beyond that, you know, I 
I talked, I interviewed the head of a war crimes commission, uh, that I, I won't, it was off the record, so I, I will not sort of attribute this, but, um, you know, what it becomes clear when you, when you interview these people is that in some sense they're show trials, right? In some sense the trial is conduct, is constructed to give the result. Because there's no international system of law that's that's recognized as legitimate. I wouldn't want to be tried under the Code Napoleon. Um, you know, they, there are multiple legal systems, and reconciling those legal systems is often impossible. Reconciling Sharia, traditional Asian legal systems, the Napoleonic Code, the Anglo-Saxon. Why do you have to reconcile? I, I mean, because there, to be international, you need. This is what happened in Nuremberg. Like the, Nuremberg, the rules were simply constructed to give the result that most people would be found guilty. And now, indeed, I agree that most of them were horribly guilty, but in some I mean, sense, like, it's not really what we think about as rule of law. What you, what you have to do is construct a set of laws that signatory nations agree make sense. I, I mean, but that's I mean really you, hard you to don't do. have to do a, uh, have a multicultural sensitivity session. You, you have to get a, a growing number of nations to sign on. And the ICC already is that, right? I mean, it has these, these rules we would be buying into if we, if, if we agreed to sign on to it. And I don't think they actually have a very big overlap with Sharia. And so that's, I don't see that as an argument for us not joining. But just the system of how you adjudicate this stuff is really difficult. I mean, like, I, I, I think that, that we would end I, up with a lot of... The American sense of justice is extremely tied to the Anglo-Saxon model of a jury of your peers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and that's not how most of the rest of the world works. And so, like, I, I think you would have that issue as well, is for us to go to the ICC, like, we'd be participating in something that most citizens don't recognize as justice. Um, as well, it, se- it seems to me you're looking pretty far down the road for possible problems rather than just saying, well, let's see what we can do, you know? And um, I, I, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, w- I would be more interested in hearing real problems that would ensue if the United States joined. To me, it's kind of and, like... And, and given the fact that we can bail out, by the way, I don't consider any of those even fatal objections. I mean, we can always withdraw from the treaty, right? To me, it's kind of like the gold standard. But it's more damaging mm-hmm. if we join and then withdraw than if we just never join, I think. Damaging to what? To the ICC? I don't. You don't seem terribly concerned with the fate of the ICC. Um, you would us, like it to be damaged. I mean, to at some us, point. right? Like, this is an, a huge... The first time the U.S. withdraws in order to prevent prosecution of one of its own nationals, that's a gigantic issue that we don't have right now. Um, that's, a, like, a, that's a huge international incident that is going to cause, like, huge problems in a way that... that Simply not joining doesn't, I think. Um, but I, I guess I, I think of it the way, you, you know, when you talk to people who support the gold standard, right, they have this, it, the gold standard is like ginseng, it cures everything, right? It, it, the government can't borrow as much, it cures this and that. And the problem is that the gold standard doesn't really give you anything that you didn't already have. If the government is not a credible steward of the money supply, they yeah. will end up devaluing and, you know, you'll be right back where you would have been with a fiat currency. And I think mm-hmm. that the ICC is the same thing. The, well, you know, it- to the extent that there are, like, if it takes cognizance of all of these international issues, and it doesn't really get you anything you couldn't have gotten by international negotiation. And if it doesn't but take what, what international negotiation is going to solve the specific problem I started out with, which is Pakistan not surrendering this guy to any, any tribunal? And, look, if he's tried in Pakistan, the view, it won't be viewed as legitimate in India. And if they don't, you know, so so what? what's the solution to okay, that so that, he, that lies right. outside of a transnational If he were court? a member of the ICC and they didn't want to surrender him, right, then then they wouldn't surrender him and they would pull out. And we would have the same issue we have now. Do we invade? Do What do we do? Well, again, you're like anticipating that the thing won't work in all of these ways rather than yes. really arguing that it's not a good idea. I'm anticipating I mean, we don't that know. it won't work. I'm anticipating that the government's... When it comes down to well, the crunch, it, with, governments with would any pull incipient, out rather than... With any incipient form of government, you could say, gosh, no, you know, people haven't signed on yet. I mean, okay. you know, there was a time when you didn't have national governments. And if you had said, oh, look, you're going you're gonna to ask, you know, 300 million people to pay taxes, and you think they're all, like a majority are going to say yes, 
And that would have been an objection. Well, here we well, are. But that, I mean, that's also true. Like, there are also a lot of stupid ideas that have, been, that have been proposed and not worked. Like, the fact that some ideas that have been proposed have worked is not an argument that all ideas that are proposed can work. Um, like, look, I think that right now, this is a diplomatic incident. If, if Pakistan pulled out of the international court, rather yeah. than letting a national be tried, that's a bigger incident. Now what do we do? Do we invade, or do we just tell people, or do we just let people know that they can pull out of this court that we have? You know, like, it, it's going to commit us to action in a way that we're not now committed, and it is going to cause a gigantic incident. I, I if you, actually if we, think there are cases, and this might be one, where the Pakistani government would be relieved to be able to turn the guy over to, the, to not have to do the trial themselves, to not have to give him to India, I think they'd love it. Possibly. Submit him to an internet, give him to an international tribunal, our hands are washed. Uh, and, 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 and whether that happens in the long run depends on whether, you know, the institution has perceived le legitimacy and whether it is, you know, kind of wisely stewarded during the early phases of its evolution. It just seems to me like you're really working hard to not like this idea no, and like anticipating all these problems down the road uh, and it's just not like the gold standard. It's Because it's a case where it does solve a problem. Well, the gold standard, like, you know, the gold standard theoretically solves some problem because it raises the bar on devaluation, but, like, um, but ultimately you end up with the devaluation. This is the thing. Okay, yes, I agree with you. There is no, like, it, it, it solves some problems. I just think you're not admitting that it also creates some potentially huge problems. Most things and, that solve problems create some. Right, well, but yes. I think it creates some potentially huge problems, and I'm not clear on how the benefit outweighs the risk. I mean, I think you don't have, like, what you have with a court system at a national level is a monopoly on the use of force. Uh -huh. You have the police force that then goes out and everyone recognizes... Well, again, you could have said the same thing about national governments. You know, the, the drift of world history is for governance to reach higher and higher levels. It has happened, it has happened again, and it has happened again. And so you, you can't say that just because at one point in the stage of evolution it seems outlandish that you would have adherence uh, at a certain level. Now, I, I, I do, you know, that, that, that means it's not going to happen. I agree with you that a, a monopoly on the use of force, uh, once you start talking about the planetary level, you should be very careful about how centralized any body is that has a monopoly on the use of force. That poses special problems. But if you don't have a monopoly on the use of force, right, like, ultimately, who's the policeman for this court? Right? Like, it's the United... The signatory nations. But it's the United States, and it's perceived as... No, it's not the United States. We have the you military. We have the military that backs it up. Ultimately, if this court does not have violence backing it up, this court does not have someone saying, like, I will arrest this guy, and I will Why try Why does it him. have to be American? Because we have... American military. Because I, I, what I am told by military experts is that, generously, there are six countries in the world that can project any serious force beyond their borders. One of them is Israel, one of them is us, one of them is Australia, one of them is Britain, one of them is France. I can't remember what the, the sixth one is. Whatever, like, the United States, Britain, Australia, and Israel, all of which are sort of perceived as this block of evil whatever by the rest of the world, of evil colonial imperialists, etc. Like, we are collectively the people who can project almost all of the force in the world. And we, so we are the police force for it, and we're not seen as legitimate. Wait, so you're imagining ICC indictments actually is a real matter being backed up by invasion? If they're not, then what's the point? Well, see, it's not clear that they would have to be. I mean, but you're I think assuming, systems... again, you're assuming, the fail, you're assuming that the institution will have no perceived legitimacy, and so you'll always be invading countries. Um, and I don't think that's the case. I, I, I think, look... Uh, if a country wanted to withdraw from the ICC, that's probably what would happen in the first instance. And the, the trick is to keep it on track in a way where there's enough perceived value to the institution that that's not what happens. But I don't think the court system, like, I don't think the reason we have a police force is that people think that the law, that the law is illegitimate. In some cases, that's true, right? But, like, I don't think that bank robbers think that what they're doing is okay and that it's not legitimate that the court wants to arrest them. They just don't want to be arrested. Um, and, and so, like, I think getting legitimacy doesn't get you there. Right, like criminal governments want to act like criminal governments 
they, it, it doesn't really matter whether they think the court is legitimate or not. You still yeah, need yeah, violent I mean, force to back it up. The bank robber in this is not analogous to the nation state. In a way, what's the analogy would be between an American state coughing up someone for a federal crime, you know, the, the American state saying, yeah, we're turning him over to federal court, uh, and they do turn people, bank robbers who commit federal crimes, over to federal courts, regardless of what the bank... It isn't The question isn't what the bank robber thinks. The question isn't what this guy in this jail in Pakistan thinks. That's not the analogy. But look what happens... That's not his, you don't, you don't, you're not looking for perceived legitimacy in the eyes of the individual criminals. You never get that. But, but look what happened when states decided that the federal government did not, in fact, have legitimacy to, uh, and, and, and try to withdraw. And what happened? The Civil War. Um, and how long ago was that? And did, and did we patch things up? And do we now have a functioning federal court system? Yeah, but we I mean, killed some. Like we killed what percent? Some like twenty or thirty percent of the population of, of the states that, that seceded of the, so what, of the young against, male population. In order, so you're to, against the federal court system? You're against there being federal crime? No, I just think that these things are very hard to get, and they have drawbacks. They are as hard well to as, get. Um, they have draw, I also think that the shape. Of, I am unlikely to support. The, I in general, I'm a federalist on law, not on all issues, but right, like, I right. also think that centralized law creates a lot of problems. It creates a lot of possibilities for getting it wrong and having no recourse, right? Once you've it got, does. once you're to one law, where do you go, where do you appeal? Governance in general is a problem. Indeed. And certainly when, with global governance, you would like to keep it as decentralized as possible. But, but I don't see... You can't have things that are decentralized but unified. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure I understand that, but uh, I think we're. I think we're uh, coming to time here. Yeah, yeah. Well, we agree on the gold standard. That's bad, yes, right? Yes, uh, we, we were definitely. Agreed. Gold standard's bad, and you're going to write checks to auto workers, and and so uh, we've established a, all I that. I just need a self-addressed stamped envelope. Uh, send that to the Atlantic, and anyone who wants a check for two cents can have one. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, glad your iPhone's uh, functioning. Thank you very much. Uh, I, enjoy, okay. I enjoyed our conversation, despite your uh, despite your unwarranted contempt for my entirely reasonable and uh, totally, feasible beliefs. No, no, you want to you, you you want you want to hear my contemptuous voice? <laughs> no, it's so much worse than no, that. No, no, I don't want to hear your contemptuous voice. I've, I've, my, my, I have a very delicate little psyche. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Well, see, I just came off this argument about uh, about this kind of stuff with Bob Kagan, you know? And talk about a guy who doesn't have a delicate little psyche, you know? He doesn't seem to. So I was still kind of in that mode, I'm afraid. I forgot. I'm, 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 like, I'm, I'm like a shy flower. Who's, you are. You, you, you need to protect you, my you're soul. You're a delicate flower of a little girl, yes, Megan. Yes, uh, You crush the petals of my soul. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was in the interest of the uh, black helicopter. I, I, I can see that. You know, I mean, and in, in fact, like I, I was, I was hoping that I, I went to a, a CFR meeting and I was hoping that they would tell us where the uh, the black helicopters were parked, but nothing. I actually don't think you have a lot of one worlders in the CFR. Are they supposedly part of the one world conspiracy? Oh, yeah, God, oh, yeah. what a deluded conspiracy theory! If they think the CFR is on board. Jeez. The CFR can't like agree on where to go to lunch. Yeah. It's, and seriously, and they're not. They're not. No, oh, don't get me started. Oh, now you got me depressed. So your ego is crushed, and I'm depressed. So I guess we might as well leave it there. Well, let's go. Let's go uh, off to our uh, our psychotropic drugs, and uh... I'm game. <laughs> well, it's good to talk you to can, you. Uh... Okay. See you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.